Chapter 5, Part 4 of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Bobby. A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Chapter 5, Part 4. Cranley had taken another dried fig from the supply in his pocket, and was eating it slowly and noisily. Temple sat on the pediment of a pillar, leaning back, his cap pulled down on his sleepy eyes. A squat young man came out of the porch, a leather portfolio tucked under his armpit. He marched towards the group, striking the flags with the heels of his boots and with the ferule of his heavy umbrella. Then, raising the umbrella in salute, he said to all, "'Good evening, sirs.' He struck the flags again and tittered while his head trembled with a slight nervous movement. The tall consumptive student and Dixon and O'Keefe were speaking in Irish and did not answer him. Then, turning to Cranley, he said, "'Good evening, particularly to you.' He moved the umbrella in indication and tittered again. Cranley, who was still chewing the fig, answered with loud movements of his jaws, "'Red? Yes, it is a good evening.' The squat student looked at him seriously and shook his umbrella gently and reprovingly. "'I can see,' he said, "'that you are about to make obvious remarks.' "'Um,' Cranley answered, holding out what remained of the half-chewed fig and jerking it towards the squat student's mouth in sign that he should eat. The squat student did not eat it, but, indulging his special humour, said gravely, still tittering and prodding his phrase with his umbrella, do you intend that he broke off pointed bluntly to the munched pulp of the fig and said loudly i allude to that um cranley said as before do you intend that now the squat student said as ipso facto or let us say as so to speak dixon turned aside from his group saying goggins was waiting for you glynn he has gone round to the adelphi to look for you and moynihan what have you there he asked tapping the portfolio under Glynn's arm. "'Examination papers,' Glynn answered. "'I give them monthly examinations to see that they are profiting by my tuition.' He also tapped the portfolio and coughed gently and smiled. "'Tuition,' said Cranley rudely. "'I suppose you mean the barefooted children that are taught by a bloody ape like you. God help them!' He bit off the rest of the fig and flung away the butt. I suffer little children to come unto me, Glynn said amiably. A bloody ape, Cranley repeated with emphasis, and a blasphemous bloody ape. Temple stood up and, pushing past Cranley, addressed Glynn. That phrase you said now, he said, is from the New Testament about suffer the children to come to me. Go to sleep again, Temple, said O'Keefe. Very well, then, Temple continued, still addressing Glynn. And if Jesus suffered the children to come, why does the church send them all to hell if they die unbaptized? Why is that? Were you baptized yourself, Temple? the consumptive student asked. But why are they sent to hell if Jesus said they were all to come? Temple said, his eyes searching in Glynn's eyes. Glynn coughed and said gently, holding back with difficulty the nervous titter in his voice and moving his umbrella at every word. And, as you remark, if it is thus, I ask emphatically, whence comes this thusness? Because the church is cruel like all old sinners, Temple said. Are you quite orthodox on that point, Temple? Dixon said suavely. St. Augustine says that about unbaptized children going to hell, Temple answered, because he was a cruel old sinner too. I bow to you, Dixon said, but I had the impression that limbo existed for such cases. Don't argue with him, Dixon. Cranley said brutally, don't talk to him or look at him. Lead him home with a shugan the way you'd lead a bleeding goat. Limbo! Temple cried. That's a fine invention, too, like hell. But with the unpleasantness left out, Dixon said. He turned smiling to the others and said, I think I am voicing the opinions of all present in saying so much. You are, Glynn said in a firm tone, on that point Ireland is united. He struck the ferule of his umbrella on the stone floor of the colonnade. Hell, Temple said, I can respect that invention of the grey spouse of Satan. Hell is Roman like the walls of the Romans, strong and ugly. But what is limbo? 
put him back into the perambulator, Cranley, O'Keefe called out. Cranley made a swift step towards Temple, halted, stamping his foot, crying as if to a fowl, Whoosh! Temple moved away nimbly. Do you know what limbo is? he cried. Do you know what we call a notion like that in Roscommon? Hush! Blast you! Cranley cried, clapping his hands. Neither my arse nor my elbow! Temple cried out scornfully, and that's what I call limbo. Give us that stick here, Cranley said. He snatched the ash plant roughly from Stephen's hand and sprang down the steps, but Temple, hearing him move in pursuit, fled through the dusk like a wild creature, nimble and fleet footed. Cranley's heavy boots were heard loudly charging across the quadrangle, and then returning heavily, foiled and spurning the gravel at each step. His step was angry, and, with an angry abrupt gesture, he thrust the stick back into Stephen's hand. Stephen felt that his anger had another cause, but, feigning patience, touched his arm slightly and said quietly, "'Cranley, I told you I wanted to speak to you. Come away.' Cranley looked at him for a few moments and asked, "'Now?' "'Yes, now,' Stephen said. "'We can't speak here. Come away.' They crossed the quadrangle together without speaking. The bird-call from Siegfried whistled softly, followed them from the steps of the porch. Cranley turned, and Dixon, who had whistled, called out, "'Where are you fellows off to? What about that game, Cranley?' They parleyed in shouts across the still air about a game of billiards to be played in the Adelphi Hotel. Stephen walked on alone and out on to the quiet of Kildare Street. Opposite Maple's Hotel he stood to wait, patient again. The name of the hotel, a colorless polished wood, and its colorless quiet front stung him like a glance of polite disdain. He stared angrily back at the softly lit drawing-room of the hotel in which he imagined the sleek lives of the patricians of Ireland housed in calm. They thought of army commissions and land grants. Peasants greeted them along the roads in the country. They knew the names of certain French dishes and gave orders to Jarvies in high-pitched provincial voices which pierced through their skin-tight accents. How could he hit their conscience, or how cast his shadow over the imaginations of their daughters, before their squires begat upon them that they might breed a race less ignoble than their own? and under the deepened dusk he felt the thoughts and desires of the race to which he belonged flitting like bats across the dark country lanes, under trees by the edges of streams and near the pool-mottled bogs. A woman had waited in the doorway as Davin had passed by at night, and, offering him a cup of milk, had all but wooed him to her bed. For Davin had the mild eyes of one who could be secret, but him no woman's eyes had wooed. His arm was taken in a strong grip, and Cranley's voice said, "'Let us eke go.' They walked southward in silence. Then Cranley said, "'That blithering idiot Temple! I swear to Moses, do you know, that I'll be the death of that fellow one time.' But his voice was no longer angry, and Stephen wondered was he thinking of her greeting to him under the porch. They turned to the left and walked on as before. When they had gone on so for some time, Stephen said, "'Cranley!' I had an unpleasant quarrel this evening. "'With your people?' Cranley asked. "'With my mother.' "'About religion?' "'Yes,' Stephen answered. After a pause, Cranley asked, "'What age is your mother?' "'Not old,' Stephen said. "'She wishes me to make my Easter duty. "'And will you?' "'I will not,' Stephen said. "'Why not?' Cranley said. "'I will not serve,' answered Stephen. "'That remark was made before,' Cranley said calmly. "'It is made behind now,' said Stephen hotly. Cranley pressed Stephen's arm, saying, "'Go easy, my dear man. You're an excitable bloody man, do you know?' He laughed nervously as he spoke, and, looking up into Stephen's face with moved and friendly eyes, said, "'Do you know that you are an excitable man?' "'I dare say I am,' said Stephen, laughing also. Their minds, lately estranged, seemed suddenly to have been drawn closer, one to the other. "'Do you believe in the Eucharist?' Cranley asked. "'I do not,' Stephen said. "'Do you disbelieve, then?' "'I neither believe in it nor disbelieve in it,' Stephen answered. "'Many persons have doubts, even religious persons, yet they overcome them or put them aside,' Cranley said. "'Are your doubts on that point too strong?' "'I do not wish to overcome them,' Stephen answered. Cranley, embarrassed for a moment, took another fig from his pocket and was about to eat it when Stephen said, "'Don't, please. 
You cannot discuss this question with your mouth full of chewed fig. Cranley examined the fig by the light of a lamp under which he halted. Then he smelt it with both nostrils, bit a tiny piece, spat it out, and threw the fig rudely into the gutter. Addressing it as it lay, he said, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Taking Stephen's arm, he went on again and said, Do you not fear that those words may be spoken to you on the day of judgment? What is offered me on the other hand? Stephen asked. An eternity of bliss in the company of the dean of studies? Remember, Cranley said, that he would be glorified. Ay, Stephen said somewhat bitterly, bright, agile, impassable, and, above all, subtle. It is a curious thing, do you know, Cranley said dispassionately, how your mind is supersaturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. Did you believe in it when you were at school? I bet you did. I did, Stephen answered. And were you happier then? Cranley asked softly. Happier than you are now, for instance? Often happy, Stephen said, and often unhappy. I was someone else then. How someone else? What do you mean by that statement? I mean, said Stephen, that I was not myself as I am now, as I had to become. Not as you are now? Not as you had to become? Cranley repeated. Let me ask you a question. Do you love your mother? Stephen shook his head slowly. I don't know what your words mean, he said simply. Have you never loved anyone? Cranley asked. Do you mean women? I am not speaking of that, Cranley said in a colder tone. I asked you if you ever felt love towards any one or anything. Stephen walked on beside his friend, staring gloomily at the footpath. I tried to love God, he said at length. It seems now I failed. It is very difficult. I tried to unite my will with the will of God instant by instant. In that I did not always fail. I could perhaps do that still. Cranley cut him short by asking, Has your mother had a happy life? How do I know? Stephen said. How many children has she? Nine or ten, Stephen answered. Some died. Was your father... Cranley interrupted himself for an instant and then said, I don't want to pry into your family affairs. But was your father what is called well-to-do, I mean, when you were growing up? Yes, Stephen said. What was he? Cranley asked after a pause. Stephen began to enumerate glibly his father's attributes. A medical student, an oarsman, a tenor, an amateur actor, a shouting politician, a small landlord, a small investor— a drinker, a good fellow, a storyteller, somebody's secretary, something in a distillery, a tax-gatherer, a bankrupt, and, at present, a praiser of his own past. Cranley laughed, tightening his grip on Stephen's arm, and said, The distillery is damn good. Is there anything else you want to know? Stephen asked. Are you in good circumstances at present? Do I look it? Stephen asked bluntly. So then, Cranley went on musingly, you were born in the lap of luxury. He used the phrase broadly and loudly, as he often used technical expressions, as if he wished his hearer to understand that they were used by him without conviction. Your mother must have gone through a good deal of suffering, he said then. Would you not try to save her from suffering more, even if... or would you? If I could, Stephen said, that would cost me very little. Then do so, Cranley said. Do as she wishes you to do. What is it for you? You disbelieve in it. It is a form, nothing else, and you will set her mind at rest. He ceased, and, as Stephen did not reply, remained silent. Then, as if giving utterance to the process of his own thought, he said, Whatever else is unsure in this stinking dunghill of a world, a mother's love is not. Your mother brings you into the world, carries you first in her body. What do we know about what she feels? But whatever she feels, it at least must be real. It must be. What are our ideas or ambitions? Play. Ideas. Why, that bloody bleating goat Temple has ideas. McCann has ideas, too. Every jackass going the roads thinks he has ideas. Stephen, who had been listening to the unspoken speech behind the words, said with assumed carelessness, Pascal, if I remember rightly, would not suffer his mother to kiss him, as he feared the contact of her sex. Pascal was a pig, 
said Cranley. Aloysius Gonzaga, I think, was of the same mind, Stephen said. And he was another pig then, said Cranley. The church calls him a saint, Stephen objected. I don't care a flaming damn what anyone calls him, Cranley said rudely and flatly. I call him a pig. Stephen, preparing the words neatly in his mind, continued, Jesus, too, seems to have treated his mother with scant courtesy in public, but Suarez, a Jesuit theologian and Spanish gentleman, has apologized for him. Did the idea ever occur to you, Cranley asked, that Jesus was not what he pretended to be? The first person to whom that idea occurred, Stephen answered, was Jesus himself. I mean, Cranley said, hardening in his speech, did the idea ever occur to you that he was himself a conscious hypocrite? what he called the Jews of his time a whited sepulchre, or, to put it more plainly, that he was a blackguard. "'That idea never occurred to me,' Stephen answered. "'But I am curious to know, are you trying to make a convert of me, or a pervert of yourself?' He turned towards his friend's face, and saw there a raw smile which some force of will strove to make finely significant. Cranley asked suddenly, in a plain, sensible tone, "'Tell me the truth.' Were you at all shocked by what I said? Somewhat, Stephen said. And why were you shocked? Cranley pressed on in the same tone. If you feel sure that our religion is false, and that Jesus was not the Son of God. I am not at all sure of it, Stephen said. He is more like a son of God than a son of Mary. And is that why you will not communicate? Cranley asked. Because you are not sure of that, too because you feel that the host, too, may be the body and blood of the Son of God, and not a wafer of bread, and because you fear that it may be. Yes, Stephen said quietly, I feel that, and I also fear it. I see, Cranley said. Stephen, struck by his tone of closure, reopened the discussion at once by saying, I fear many things, dogs, horses, firearms, the sea, thunderstorms, machinery, the country roads at night. But why do you fear a bit of bread? I imagine, Stephen said, that there is a malevolent reality behind those things I say I fear. Do you fear then, Cranley asked, that the God of the Roman Catholics would strike you dead and damn you if you made a sacrilegious communion? The God of the Roman Catholics could do that now, Stephen said. I fear more than that the chemical action which would be set up in my soul by a false homage to a symbol behind which are massed twenty centuries of authority and veneration. Would you, Cranley asked, in extreme danger commit that particular sacrilege, for instance, if you lived in the penal days? I cannot answer for the past, Stephen replied. Possibly not. Then, said Cranley, you do not intend to become a Protestant? I said that I had lost the faith, Stephen answered, but not that I had lost self-respect. What kind of liberation would that be, to forsake an absurdity which is logical and coherent, and to embrace one which is illogical and incoherent. They had walked on towards the township of Pembroke, and now, as they went on slowly along the avenues, the trees and the scattered lights in the villas soothed their minds. The air of wealth and repose diffused about them seemed to comfort their neediness. Behind a hedge of laurel a light glimmered in the window of a kitchen, and the voice of a servant was heard singing as she sharpened knives. She sang in short broken bars, Rosie O'Grady. Cranley stopped to listen, saying, Mulier cantat. The soft beauty of the Latin word touched with an enchanting touch the dark of the evening, with a touch fainter and more persuading than the touch of music or of a woman's hand. The strife of their minds was quelled. The figure of woman, as she appears in the liturgy of the church, passed silently through the darkness, a white-robed figure small and slender as a boy, and with a falling girdle. Her voice, frail and high as a boy's, was heard intoning from a distant choir the first words of a woman which pierced the gloom and clamour of the first chanting of the Passion, Et tu cum Jesu Galileo eras. And all hearts were touched and turned to her voice, shining like a young star, shining clearer as the voice intoned the proper oxyton, and more faintly as the cadence died. The singing ceased. They went on together, Cranley repeating in strongly stressed rhythm the end of the refrain, And when we are married, oh, how happy we'll be! For I love sweet Rosie O'Grady, and Rosie O'Grady loves me. 
There's real poetry for you, he said. There's real love. He glanced sideways at Stephen with a strange smile and said, Do you consider that poetry, or do you know what the words mean? I want to see Rosie first, said Stephen. She's easy to find, Cranley said. His hat had come down on his forehead. He shoved it back, and in the shadow of the trees Stephen saw his pale face, framed by the dark, and his large dark eyes. Yes, his face was handsome, and his body was strong and hard. He had spoken of a mother's love. He felt then the sufferings of women, the weaknesses of their bodies and souls, and would shield them with a strong and resolute arm and bow his mind to them. Away, then. It is time to go. A voice spoke softly to Stephen's lonely heart, bidding him go, and telling him that his friendship was coming to an end. Yes, he would go. He could not strive against another. He knew his part. Probably I shall go away, he said. Where? Cranley asked. Where I can, Stephen said. Yes, Cranley said. It might be difficult for you to live here now. But is it that that makes you go? I have to go, Stephen answered. Because, Cranley continued, you need not look upon yourself as driven away if you do not wish to go, or as a heretic or an outlaw. There are many good believers who think as you do. Would that surprise you? The church is not the stone building, nor even the clergy and their dogmas. It is the whole mass of those born into it. I don't know what you wish to do in life. Is it what you told me the night we were standing outside Harcourt Street Station? Yes, Stephen said, smiling in spite of himself at Cranley's way of remembering thoughts in connection with places. The night you spent half an hour wrangling with Doherty about the shortest way from Sally Gap to Laris. Pothead! Cranley said with calm contempt. What does he know about the way from Salagap to Laris? Or what does he know about anything for that matter, and the big slobbering washing-pot head of him? He broke out into a long laugh. Well, Stephen said, do you remember the rest? What you said, is it? Cranley asked. Yes, I remember it. To discover the mode of life or of art whereby your spirit could express itself in unfettered freedom. Stephen raised his hat in acknowledgment. Freedom, Cranley repeated. But you are not free enough yet to commit a sacrilege. Tell me, would you rob? I would beg first, Stephen said. And if you got nothing, would you rob? You wish me to say, Stephen answered, that the rights of property are provisional, and that in certain circumstances it is not unlawful to rob. Every one would act in that belief. So I will not make you that answer. Apply to the Jesuit theologian Juan Mariana de Talavera, who will also explain to you in what circumstances you may lawfully kill your king, and whether you had better hand him his poison in a goblet, or smear it for him upon his robe or his saddle-bow. Ask me, rather, would I suffer others to rob me, or, if they did, would I call down upon them what I believe is called the chastisement of the secular arm? And would you? I think, Stephen said, it would pain me as much to do so as to be robbed. I see, Cranley said. He produced his match and began to clean the crevice between two teeth. Then he said carelessly, Tell me, for example, would you deflower a virgin? Excuse me, Stephen said politely, is that not the ambition of most young gentlemen? What then is your point of view? Cranley asked. His last phrase, sour-smelling as the smoke of charcoal and disheartening, excited Stephen's brain, over which its fumes seemed to brood. "'Look here, Cranley,' he said. "'You have asked me what I would do and what I would not do. I will tell you what I will do and what I will not do. I will not serve that in which I no longer believe, whether it call itself my home, my fatherland, or my church. And I will try to express myself in some mode of life or art as freely as I can, and as wholly as I can, using for my defence the only arms I allow myself to use.' Silence, exile, and cunning. Cranley seized his arm and steered him round so as to head back towards Leeson Park. He laughed almost slyly and pressed Stephen's arm with an elder's affection. Cunning indeed, he said. Is it you, you poor poet, you? And you made me confess to you, Stephen said, thrilled by his touch, as I have confessed to you so many other things, have I not? Yes, my child, Cranley said still gaily. 
You made me confess the fears that I have. But I will tell you also what I do not fear. I do not fear to be alone, or to be spurned for another, or to leave whatever I have to leave. And I am not afraid to make a mistake, even a great mistake, a lifelong mistake, and perhaps as long as eternity, too. Cranley, now grave again, slowed his pace and said, Alone, quite alone. You have no fear of that. And you know what that word means? Not only to be separate from all others, but to have not even one friend. I will take the risk, said Stephen. And not to have any one person, Cranley said, who would be more than a friend, more even than the noblest and truest friend a man ever had. His words seemed to have struck some deep chord in his own nature. Had he spoken of himself, of himself as he was, or wished to be? Stephen watched his face for some moments in silence. A cold sadness was there. He had spoken of himself, of his own loneliness, which he feared. "'Of whom are you speaking?' Stephen asked at length. Cranley did not answer. 20 March. Long talk with Cranley on the subject of my revolt. He had his grand manner on. I, supple and suave, attacked me on the score of love for one's mother. Tried to imagine his mother. Cannot. Told me once, in a moment of thoughtlessness, his father was sixty-one when he was born. Can see him. Strong farmer type. Pepper and salt suit. Square feet. Unkempt grizzled beard. Probably attends coursing matches. Pays his dues regularly, but not plentifully, to Father Dwyer of Laris. Sometimes talks to girls after nightfall. But his mother? Very young or very old? Hardly the first. If so, Cranley would not have spoken as he did. Old, then. Probably and neglected. Hence Cranley's despair of soul. The child of exhausted loins. 21 March, Morning Thought this in bed last night, but was too lazy and free to add it. Free, yes. The exhausted loins are those of Elizabeth and Zachary. Then he is the precursor. Item. He eats chiefly belly bacon and dried figs. Read locusts and wild honey. Also, when thinking of him, saw always a stern severed head or death mask, as if outlined on a grey curtain or Veronica. Decolation, they call it, in the fold. Puzzled for the moment by St. John at the Latin gate. What do I see? A decollated precursor trying to pick the lock. 21 March, night. Free. Soul free and fancy free. Let the dead bury the dead. Aye, and let the dead marry the dead. 22 March. In company with Lynch followed a sizable hospital nurse. Lynch's idea. Dislike it. Two lean hungry greyhounds walking after a heifer. 23 March. Have not seen her since that night. Unwell? Sits at the fire, perhaps, with Mama's shawl on her shoulders. But not peevish. A nice bowl of gruel? Won't you now? 24 March. Began with a discussion with my mother. Subject B.V.M. Handicapped by my sex and youth. To escape held up relations between Jesus and Papa against those between Mary and her son. Said religion was not a lying-in hospital. Mother indulgent. Said I have a queer mind and have read too much. Not true. Have read little and understood less. Then she said I would come back to faith because I had a restless mind. This means to leave church by back door of sin and re-enter through the skylight of repentance. Cannot repent. Told her so and asked for sixpence. Got threepence. Then went to college. Other wrangle with little round-head rogues I get see. This time about Bruno the Nolan. Began in Italian and ended in Pigeon English. He said Bruno was a terrible heretic. I said he was terribly burned. He agreed to this with some sorrow. Then gave me a recipe for what he calls risotto alla bergamasca. When he pronounces a soft O, he protrudes his full carnal lips as if he kissed the vowel. Has he? And could he repent? Yes, he could, and cry two round rogue's tears, one from each eye. Crossing Stevens, that is, my green, remembered that his countrymen, and not mine, had invented what Cranley the other night called our religion. 
A quartet of them, soldiers of the 97th Infantry Regiment, sat at the foot of the cross and tossed up dice for the overcoat of the crucified. Went to library. Tried to read three reviews. Useless. She is not out yet. Am I alarmed? About what? That she will never be out again. Blake wrote, I wonder if William Bond will die, for assuredly he is very ill. Alas, poor William! I was once at a diorama in Rotunda. At the end were pictures of big knobs. Among them William Ewart Gladstone, just then dead. Orchestra played, Oh, Willie, we have missed you. A race of clodhoppers. 25 March, morning. A troubled night of dreams. Want to get them off my chest. A long curving gallery. From the floor ascend pillars of dark vapors. It is peopled by the images of fabulous kings set in stone. Their hands are folded upon their knees in token of weariness, and their eyes are darkened, for the errors of men go up before them forever as dark vapors. Strange figures advance from a cave. They are not as tall as men. One does not seem to stand quite apart from another. Their faces are phosphorescent with darker streaks. They peer at me, and their eyes seem to ask me something. They do not speak. 30 March This evening Cranley was in the porch of the library, proposing a problem to Dixon and her brother. A mother let her child fall into the Nile, still harping on the mother. A crocodile seized the child. Mother asked it back. Crocodile said all right if she told him what he was going to do with the child, eat it or not eat it. This mentality, Lepidus would say, is indeed bred out of your mud by the operation of your son. And mine? Is it not too? Then into Nile mud with it. 1 April. Disapprove of this last phrase. 2 April. Saw her drinking tea and eating cakes in Johnston, Mooney, and O'Brien's. Rather, lynx-eyed Lynch saw her as we passed. He tells me Cranley was invited there by brother. Did he bring his crocodile? Is he the shining light now? Well, I discovered him. I protest I did, shining quietly behind a bushel of Wicklow bran. 3 April. Met Davin at the cigar shop opposite Findlater's church. He was in a black sweater and had a hurley stick. Asked me was it true I was going away and why. Told him the shortest way to Terra was via Holyhead. Just then my father came up. Introduction. Father, polite and observant, asked Davin if he might offer him some refreshment. Davin could not, was going to a meeting. When we came away, father told me he had a good, honest eye. Asked me why I did not join a rowing club. I pretended to think it over. Told me then how he broke Pennyfeather's heart. Wants me to read law. Says I was cut out for that. More mud, more crocodiles. 5 April. Wild spring. Scudding clouds. Oh, life! Dark stream of swirling bog-water on which apple-trees have cast down their delicate flowers. Eyes of girls among the leaves. Girls demure and romping. All fair or auburn. No dark ones. They blush better. Hoopla! 6 April. Certainly she remembers the past. Lynch says all women do. Then she remembers the time of her childhood, and mine, if I was ever a child. The past is consumed in the present, and the present is living only because it brings forth the future. Statues of women, if Lynch be right, should always be fully draped, one hand of the woman feeling regretfully her own hinder parts. 6 April, later. Michael Robartus remembers forgotten beauty, and, when his arms wrap her round, he presses in his arms the loveliness which has long faded from the world. Not this, not at all. I desire to press in my arms the loveliness which has not yet come into the world. 10 April Faintly, under the heavy night, through the silence of the city which has turned from dreams to dreamless sleep as a weary lover whom no caresses move, the sound of hoofs upon the road. Not so faintly now as they come near the bridge, and in a moment as they pass the darkened windows the silence is cloven by alarm as by an arrow. They are heard now far away, hoofs that shine amid the heavy night as gems, hurrying beyond the sleeping fields to what journey's end, what heart, bearing what tidings. 11 April. Read what I wrote last night, vague words for a vague emotion. Would she like it? 
I think so. Then I should have to like it also. 13 April That tundish has been on my mind for a long time. I looked it up and find it English, and good old blunt English, too. Damn the dean of studies and his funnel! What did he come here for, to teach us his own language, or to learn it from us? Damn him, one way or the other! 14 April John Alphonsus Mulrainen has just returned from the west of Ireland. European and Asiatic papers, please copy. He told us he met an old man there in a mountain cabin. Old man had red eyes and short pipe. Old man spoke Irish. Mulrennan spoke Irish. Then old man and Mulrennan spoke English. Mulrennan spoke to him about universe and stars. Old man sat, listened, smoked, spat, then said, Ah, there must be terrible queer creatures at the latter end of the world. I fear him. I fear his red-rimmed, horny eyes. It is with him I must struggle all through this night till day come, till he or I lie dead, gripping him by the sinewy throat till—till till what? Till he yield to me? No. I mean him no harm. 15 April Met her to-day point-blank in Grafton Street. The crowd brought us together. We both stopped. She asked me why I never came, said she had heard all sorts of stories about me. This was only to gain time. Asked me, was I writing poems? About whom? I asked her. This confused her more, and I felt sorry and mean. Turned off that valve at once, and opened the spiritual heroic refrigerating apparatus, invented and patented in all countries by Dante Alieri. Talked rapidly of myself and my plans. In the midst of it, unluckily, I made a sudden gesture of a revolutionary nature. I must have looked like a fellow throwing a handful of peas into the air. People began to look at us. She shook hands a moment after, and, in going away, said she hoped I would do what I said. Now I call that friendly, don't you? Yes, I liked her today. A little or much? Don't know. I liked her, and it seems a new feeling to me. Then, in that case, all the rest, all that I thought I thought, and all that I felt I felt, all the rest before now, in fact. Oh, give it up, old chap. Sleep it off. 16 April. Away! Away! The spell of arms and voices, the white arms of roads, their promise of close embraces, and the black arms of tall ships that stand against the moon, their tale of distant nations. They are held out to say, We are alone. Come. And the voices say with them, We are your kinsmen. And the air is thick with their company, as they call to me, their kinsmen, making ready to go, shaking the wings of their exultant and terrible youth. 26 April Mother is putting my new second-hand clothes in order. She prays now, she says, that I may learn in my own life and away from home and friends what the heart is and what it feels. Amen. So be it. Welcome, O life! I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience, and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. 27 April Old Father, old Artificer, stand me now and ever in good stead. Dublin, 1904. Trieste, 1914. End of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man